Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Special greetings to all of you out there on the internet. And to ask our congregation here today, where were you last week? <laughs> I guess a lot of you had, I don't I guess I better put this on so I can see my notes. I can see you without them, but I can't see my notes. Uh, we did not have our biggest crowd last week. In fact, it's probably been the lowest crowd that any of us could remember in some time. So we had a rousing song service with a few of us that were here. But uh, I know Dave appreciates everybody being here today. <clears throat> if you will, as I go through the message today, you might pay attention in connecting it with some of the things that Wynn said, as well as the fact of this uh, debate that's coming up with Adrian Davis. I did not plan it knowing any of that was going to happen, but I think it will connect in, in some way or another. You know, every day each of us pray. And in our daily prayers, I think all of us should pray, and certainly not necessarily in these exact words, but something similar. Father, teach me truth. Teach me your way. Make it plain to me, O Lord, and reveal your truth to me, and don't let me be a hindrance to others, but a help that we're constantly not hindering someone, but helping others. You remember what it was said by Christ over in John chapter 17 and verse 17 on that subject? Sanctify them through your truth, for your word is truth. In 1 John chapter 16 and verse 13, a very compatible scripture when it says, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, of course speaking of Christ, is come, He will guide you into all truth. And one of the scripture back in the Old Testament, in Psalms chapter 31 and verse 1, it says, In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. And then it goes on to say, Let me never be ashamed or confounded, confused, but deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear unto me and deliver me speedily. Be my strong rock. Be a strong house of defense to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your namesake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net or the trap that, that they have laid for me, for you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, O Lord God of truth. And I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but Father, I trust in the Lord." You see the connection there, I hope, between truth and lying and trust. They really go together very, very well. In fact, is you can't have one without the other. So what causes us, what causes us to trust God? Why should we trust God? What is it that gives us the confidence to trust in God when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances or situations. In verse 14 of Psalms chapter 31, it says, But I trusted in you, O Lord, for I said, You are my God. You know, we have seen this nation, especially since 9-11, and how can we ever forget that particular day? Every one of us probably can remember exactly where we were at the time when the attacks happened on the Twin Towers. And uh, I was driving into Tyler at the time when the news came on, heading toward a meeting. And uh, just one of those things, I, it's like, where were you when John F. Kennedy was assassinated? I still remember exactly where I was, what I was doing, the, you know, embedded into my brain. But when that happened, you know, this nation over the years has been besieged by our enemies. The great turning to God that happened after 9-11. All the churches, it seemed like, reported tremendous increases in attendance. Did it last very long? Almost the day afterwards, it started going downhill, got back to quote, quote, whatever is, is normal. It proved to be just a temporary, as it were, turning toward God. What is it that turns people not away from God, because in most cases they were not ever with God to begin with? But what is it that God does or, or did not do to protect us? Did he let our enemies attack us in 9-11? Even with some of the most recent tragedies like we've seen in 
Southern Springs, Las Vegas. You know, you almost hate to pick up the newspaper or listen to news anymore because the latest shooting, the latest whatever it is that's come along, it just, I don't know, shocks you. And all the revelations we've had this past week and people that have been known for different situations are now known as predators. What message did people hear after 9-11 when they returned to their church, or if they were returning after having been gone for a long time? What was the message that possibly that they heard, um, even if they just came back temporarily? Did they hear that contrary to all of the facts, even we are, when we are besieged, the scripture as it is in Psalms chapter 31, verse 14, I trusted in you, O Lord, I said, you are my God. In effect, by saying that without, you know, without any qualification, I trusted in you, you are my God. What is it that makes a person trust in God? Especially in a really bad situation, in the reality of terrible circumstances in our lives sometimes, deaths, illnesses, you know, you know you're familiar with all the difficulties we go into. When our enemies attacked us, the great physical illness that some have, financial destruction, distress, some other great tragedy that comes along, do we say with our eyes wide open, I trust in my God? I trust you, Father. In fact, what causes anyone to be able to trust anyone else? Who do you trust? Why do you trust them? They have to be a person that is found trustworthy. They have told you the truth. Because if some, someone lies to you and you know about it, how do you feel about them? You don't have that same trust factor that you would have otherwise. I want for a moment just for you to pause and think about someone that you can say that you fully and completely trust. I'm not just saying, oh, I trust so-and-so to do so. Who would you put your life into their hands? Regardless of the circumstances, you say, I trust them implicitly. That they would never do me wrong. They would never hurt me. They would never cause anything bad to happen to me. Now, what are the characteristics that make you trust in that person? Is it love? Well, I think love is important. I think love is very much a part of it. But is love enough? Is love alone enough that you implicitly trust someone no matter the situation, the circumstances, or the results of what happens? When we really trust someone, it's when we found out that they have, day in, day out, without fail, consistently told the truth. And that you can believe them. Look back at chapter 31 of Psalms in the verse 5 we just read earlier. It says, Into your hand I commit my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. What we need to fully understand, and certainly at the same time to celebrate, is that you and I have a God of truth. Without any reservation, without any consolation or anything else. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, scripture probably many of you are familiar with, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, He promised before the world began. We'll read that again. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Now none of us will commit our lives, I don't think, or our spirit into the hands of anyone that we do not really and truly trust. In the truest sense of the world, all of us, everyone in this audience today and all of you out there on the internet, we are all ministers of God. We have been called to minister to other people, to serve them, to help them, to help them along their way. So who do we commit our life to? Who is it that we really fully trust? For you see, when we as individuals minister or witness to other people, aren't we asking them to commit their life? to that same situation, 
their spirit, as it were, to Jesus Christ. As we go through times of tragedy in our lives and times of distress, suffering, whatever the situation may be, why should they trust God if they haven't previously? Verse 5 of chapter 31 of Psalms says, You have redeemed me. So who do we really trust to redeem us? In Psalms chapter 130 and verse 7, it says, With the Lord there is truly... I'm sorry, I didn't turn my page and get the right scripture. There is truly mercy, and with Him is plenteous redemption. God will, because He promises and God cannot lie, fully redeem us. But that necessitates and calls for and requires a trust relationship. We would not and we certainly should not expect someone else to commit their life or their trust, especially for redemption, to anyone we feel like that we cannot believe in, someone that we don't trust. But it clearly states in the Word of God that our God is a God of truth. But you know that, don't you? You already know that. You understand that, at least implicitly at some level. How deeply is that trust in us? How much can we rely upon that? But why is that point so important, that God is a God of truth? When and if we listen sometimes to those who begin to reject Christianity, those who maybe leave a church or those that are called in, in the great scheme of things, the unchurched, what are they saying? And I don't know how many of you may have read this story, but back when 9-11 happened, one uh, Christian counselor went to a local high school to talk to some of the children that were there who had been affected by the explosions in Twin, to in Twin Towers. One of the first people he talked to said, don't even bring up the name of God. Don't even bring the name up. The implication was, of course, they were lied to. God lied to us. He says, don't give me anything about your God because we have been lied to. But I think, you know, we all reject almost naturally what we cannot trust. Is it not true that in, in times of difficulty, in a time we're looking for deliverance, we continually look in our lives for someone or something that we can trust? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Please don't. But when I asked that question a while ago, how many of you immediately thought of someone that you knew implicitly without any question that you could trust no matter what? Think about that. Many people, including unfortunately too many of our young people, say things that we don't like to hear them say. And I'm not saying that anyone in this room is, is talking about that, but last night on one of the TV programs, it was addressing the opioid crisis that we're presently in. And it's a situation where a lot of people, including a lot of young people, are overdosing with these opioids, which are very addictive. But you know, a lot of young people over the years, and even some not so young, have said, I can trust the bottle. When I drink it, it delivers. I can trust a drug. I take it. And it delivers what I'm looking for, maybe more than what I'm looking for. We trust in the flesh sometimes. We indulge and it delivers. We have a trust relationship with that. But too many people in this world honestly feel that they, God has lied to them because He did not deliver when they put their trust in Him. We reject anything, I think, as a people that we cannot trust. But a trust relationship is built upon truth. It's got to be. Some people feel God has lied to them. We just looked at the scripture in Titus, but another one over in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19. It said, God is not a man that he should lie. And those aren't the only scriptures. You could look it up, but there are others as well. So who's lying? Well, let me put it to you in my finest and best Mississippi lingo. It ain't God. Okay? It ain't God that's doing the lying. So who is lying? Who is it that's not telling the truth? 
Now, this is not necessarily, I'm sure, a very popular, especially to a lot of people, or politically correct statement. But those who claim to represent the things of the faith that they represent, those who say they represent God, they are the ones who have lied. Because too often, the truth was not told. So when a crisis or a tragedy appears in their life, God has been mis misrepresented to them, and people are not prepared for what they receive. They took what they were told as truth, and now it appears to be a lie. So we turn away from God and go in the other direction, because we think God has lied. And I'm not necessarily saying that's your case. I'm saying in the people in general in this world today. So, no, we know God has not, God did not, God cannot lie. But man has lied about God. God has never misrepresented himself. But when he is misrepresented by others, it makes God look either weak or mean-spirited. You know, why will God not save me from this? Or however else it, it may be expressed. If we do not, as a people, as ministers, as we all are, teach people the entirety of the Word of God, the full truth about God and His way, then when crisis or tragedy, difficulty strikes, we have a false impression. We have no correct reference point to turn to. They think that God is lied or He's weak, and they turn and go in the other direction. It is paramount that all of us, no matter who we are, where we are, at all times in our life, we individually and corporately as a part of the body of Christ, that we, anyone who claims to know God, to speak as the Word of God, to always base the truth that we tell people about God upon what is called the whole counsel of Scripture. Not a Scripture here and a Scripture there. A lot of people are fond of proof texting. And you've heard these little proof texting wars where people will bounce back and forth and throw scriptures at each other like little cherry bombs or something and trying to prove their point. No, we've got to look at the whole counsel of scripture. Everything that the Bible says. And not just a scripture that tells the story that we want to tell or a scripture that supports our viewpoint. There are two opposite extremes of this type of misrepresentation. One of them is called, in, in the general thing of religion, hyper-prosperity. I don't know if you've ever heard that word used or not, but it's the old, you know, if you do right with God, that God is a blessing God, that all God will do is bless you if you represent God as being that away. He, he's great. He, if you're healthy, He'll make you healthy. He'll make you wealthy. And a lot of times it's based upon if you send money into my program. The prosperity doctrine. But they never talk about the other side of the potential of what can happen in our lives. That God is only a God of blessing. But you know, God is many things. He is the God that we see in Genesis and all the way to Revelation. He is immutable. He changes not. We've already seen He does not lie. We can know Him through the pages of that book you have sitting on your lap. But we must use all of those pages and not just the ones that we think favor our political, our personal you know, teaching at that particular time or that fits our needs. The hyper-prosperity teaching says that if we are truly, truly people of faith, we will always be blessed. That things will always go well. And our problems will never come. We will not always only be healthy, we'll be wealthy. We will have it all. Tell that to the people who have died as a result of their faith. To those who today are being persecuted beyond our wildest imaginations. If you've done any research, you will know that the truth right now is that the Christian faith worldwide is going through the greatest persecution in the history of the church. We think we are somewhat immune here in the Western civilization, but there's still some going on here as well. But you take the world as a whole, and we're in the greatest persecution that the church has ever known. 
It may not be happening to us today, but in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, and another scripture I think many of you are probably familiar with, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, does that mean everyone in this room or on this broadcast out on the Internet is going to suffer persecution exactly the same or whatever? No, but it says that all that live godly will suffer persecution. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Verse 13 in Matthew 24. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. There's the truth. Doesn't say we're not going to have any persecution. Doesn't say we're not going to have any trials. It said we shall be saved. If we teach that the lives of all Christians never have any suffering, never have any difficulty, never go through any trials, then we teach a lie. In James chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. If you've read the prophets and the things that they went through, or if you read in the New Testament and the things that the apostles of Jesus Christ, the things that they went through, we don't have time today to enumerate all of them, but if you've heard anything at all, you know what I'm talking about. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job. You know the story of Job. You've heard the story. Did he not, not have any trials, any persecutions? He lost everything. But was in the end, was he saved? Absolutely. And have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Speaking of our Savior Jesus Christ. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And one last scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10 where it says, But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a little while, will make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. And we can say, yea, God, please come quickly. That is the whole counsel of God. We cannot serve up our religion, as it were, a la carte. Instead of man created in the image of God, too often we try to create God in our image. Or the God of our imagination. The things that we imagine and would like for Him to be like sometimes. The way we want Him to be. No wonder that some have said that that is God, I want no part of it. You can understand more truly or freely why they say that. We must, therefore, base our beliefs and our teaching on, and our teaching to others to trust God based on who He is and what His promises are and not that if we have faith that all of a sudden we'll have it all. All we've got to do is believe and everything's going to fall into place. God is not the guarantor of the lottery. Have anybody in this room lately won the lottery? I didn't think so. God is the guarantor of freedom, the guarantor of eternal life. Remember the scripture again in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world began. That's a guarantee if we follow the scripture. Now the other extreme from hyper-prosperity is what they call hyper-fundamentalist. That is where one who, you have probably seen them on television or heard them, uh, something I read one time, they bruise their fist every time they speak because they're you know, pounding on the, on the pulpit. That hurt too. Um, they tried to condemn people. They tried to shame people into accepting God. And again, most of it is if you'll support me, you know, you'll be okay. Years ago, uh, I was in a program that we were sponsoring a radio program on a radio station and could not figure out why the program was not getting any res results. And come to find out there was an individual speaking just before that program who was one of that type, just absolutely railing away, you're going to go to hell, you're, you know, God's never going to listen to you, you're going to be you know, condemned to hell forever if you don't you know, send me some money. People were turning him off. 
and they never would turn the radio back on to hear the program that followed it. As soon as they got rid of him, immediately started having responses. It's just one of those people that serves up that religion, their religion that particular way. And remember the scripture over in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 15 when it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Again, someone pounding away at people, trying to get them to be part of a specific doctrine that they teach, which is not the counsel of the Scripture. It's not the, the way God is. It's not the God of truth that we know. But you know, if you think this was only talking to the Pharisees of the time, we have another thing coming because we see teachings going on just today in that same situation, that same way in our lands as well. And sometimes, unfortunately, in the teaching of our youth, and they begin to turn away at a very, very young age. We do not know everything Christ ever said or did. It's not recorded. But we certainly have all that we need. It's in the Word. No lie, no even slight misrepresentation is of the truth. When we teach the whole truth of God, that does not mean that there will not be a tragedy. That does not mean there will be some difficulty that will come along in our lives. There will not be some suffering from time to time. But when we have taught the truth, people are then prepared for it, and they will say then that God did not lie. God's Word warns us that difficulties, that trials, that sufferings will happen. But truth breeds trust. And I think that's the reason most of you are here today. We all need something or someone that we can trust at all times. God says that we will answer to Him. And we need to recognize that we're just playing games with God if we're not teaching the entirety of His Word in every aspect of our life. And if you ever get into a situation where that is not being done, you need to leave immediately. In John chapter 17 and verse 33, it says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace, for in the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And then in 1 Peter, my notes are sticking together today. It says, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Now we may have thought this was just an analogy or a paraphrasing or something, but this is the truth of the word. Satan is alive and well. He is seeking whom he may devour, and he is after the people of God. Resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions that are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world but the God of all grace who has called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a little while, again, will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I'd like to read to you from a card I got yesterday from an old friend, some of you know, Andy and Joyce Green. The closing of it, at the bottom of it said, God does not give you what you can handle. God helps you handle what you are given. I'm going to repeat that again. God does not give you what you can handle. Because you know, He says in the other ways in the Scriptures that He is going to present us to try us in fire so that we are ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. But God will help you handle what you are given. He enclosed with that note and letter a quotation from a guy by the name of Bill Tinsley, who I've heard of before, but I don't remember where. But he quotes a particular scripture, which, and this is in one of the newer modern versions. It's from Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 3. It says, You who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb. This was, was specifically addressed to those who have grown old with God and did not realize when we got there, but all of a sudden we realized we are there. I could identify you have been born by me from birth and have carried from the womb, even to your old age. I will be the same, and even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it, and I will carry you, 
and I will bear you and I will deliver you. A promise from God that from the wound to our graying years to the grave, He will be with us, He will guide us, He will direct us, He will protect us. So what is our answer to all people? Should truth, should it be the truth? Does the truth also include things like Romans 12, verse 9, when it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God has promised us so many things that if we will just trust in Him, if we will just lend our life to Him, we also know that God said in Matthew chapter 23, Woe unto you who have done these things, for He will repay. So if someone is, is afflicting you or persecuting you or troubling you, you don't have to worry. God's going to work it all out. Our God is a God of truth. He is truth. The truth of God breeds trust. So why should we trust God? I say it's because He is the God of truth. He will deliver on His promise of eternal life. But we also need to understand and realize, and I hope we do, that probably along the way there will be a couple of bumps, a few speed bumps as we go through life. Every one of you have already experienced one or two or three or four of them already in your life. You can sit here and sort of reminisce back in your life probably. But what happened? You came through them. Once you got through them, they didn't seem to be near as big as they were when you were going through them. God will settle us. He will strengthen us. He will establish us. Some people may, along the way, misrepresent God, may not tell the truth. Let that not be our way. Because the Scripture says, Thy word is truth. God cannot lie. He is the God of truth. And that's why I trust God and I hope we all do. But how about you? Do you really, do you really trust God no matter what? So why should we trust God? For He is the God of truth.